Hello and welcome to this webinar hosted by the Honeybee Health Coalition as part of their Hot Topics series. My name is Dr. Kelly Kohanek and I'm going to be talking to you about what we know about robbing, plant bombs, and large-scale varroa spread. So just to introduce myself, I am an assistant professor of pollinator research and extension at Washington State University, I'm currently based here in Pullman in Eastern Washington. And I'm going to be talking about first a lot of the research that other great scientists have done on these topics of um, landscape level varroa spread and robbing and drift and all that kind of thing. And then I'll end with an experiment I did as part of my PhD at the University of Maryland, looking at some of these issues to hopefully provide some information about why we need to be thinking about these things sort of at the community level. And so, um, you know, just to kind of set the scene in the context that we're all working in as beekeepers here in the United States, our landscapes are very, very crowded with honeybee colonies. And so, you know, this is a picture of a commercial apiary where we have lots of colonies and bees sort of packed into one area. And this is a situation that happens a lot in commercial beekeeping where we have these big pollination or honey production events and there's a large number of beekeepers and colonies packed into a small area. And, you know, I love this map of the registered apiaries in North Dakota. It really shows how on top of each other all these beekeepers are uh, when they move their colonies to North Dakota for honey production. And so, you know, again, a very crowded landscape. And so we see this a lot in commercial beekeeping, but we also see this with hobbyist and stationary beekeeping. So if we look at a state, for example, like North Carolina, um, that has relatively fewer commercial beekeeping activities um, and has a larger percentage of stationary and hobbyist beekeepers, we can see that this is still a very crowded landscape. And so even in sort of suburban um, or semi-urban areas, uh, we are still very packed together, very crowded landscapes, lots of beekeepers nearby. And so, you know, really what your neighbor is doing in terms of beekeeping management affects your colonies as well. And so, you know, these crowded landscapes kind of have effects on our bee health. And one of the things that research has shown over and over again is that when these landscapes are crowded with honeybee colonies, those colonies experience higher varroa pressure. And so this is from a paper by Nolan and Delaplane where they um, looked at spacing colonies at different distances apart. And so we have some colonies that are spaced very close together at zero meters apart, 10 meters apart, and then colonies that are spaced 100 meters apart. And you can see that you know, kind of over this fall period where they're sampling for varroa mites, the colonies that are spaced 100 meters apart in green here tend to have lower mite loads than the colonies that are spaced closer together. And so, you know, again, this idea of dispersing colonies more loosely, uh, reducing varroa pressure, but a lot of the time that's just not possible, right? We oftentimes don't have that much space to space our colonies that far apart. And then this is another sort of similar result from Seeley and Smith, where they looked at colonies that were loosely dispersed versus colonies that were crowded together. And again, the mite drop for colonies that are crowded together is much higher sort of throughout the whole season compared to colonies that are more loosely dispersed. And this is another one by Frey and Rosencrantz, where they had colonies at a high bee density, HBD, um, and a low bee density, so much more loosely dispersed again. And you can see again that mite count in those high bee density apiaries is much higher. Um, and we have pretty low mite counts in those low bee density apiaries. So again, this effect of crowding these colonies together in apiaries and in the landscape, really increasing varroa pressure. And um, one of the reasons this happens is that varroa and the viruses that are vectored by varroa can influence bee behavior to increase dispersal. So the mites and the viruses um, have sort of a drive to survive and to spread to other colonies nearby, right? So um, there have been a couple really cool papers that have actually shown that varroa and viruses actually change the behavior of the bees to um, help disperse themselves. And so this paper by Kralj and Fuchs shows 
um, that foragers that are infested with mites actually spend more time outside their colony. So again, over here, we have time spent outside the colony with infested or, uh, foragers and non-infested foragers. Foragers that were infested with mites, when they leave the colony, they spend more time out there, um, presumably you know, visiting other colonies, drifting to other colonies, um, and they you know, are spending more time in the landscape, potentially contributing more to the spread of varroa and viruses uh, the longer they're outside their own colony. And they also found that foragers that had mites were less likely to return home to their colony at all. So 42% um, of workers that were infested with mites never returned to the colony compared to only 28% of non-infested workers. So this is kind of where this idea of this like mite bomb comes from where you have these colonies that are very highly infested with mites. And for some reason, the navigation or the homing abilities of those bees is impaired. And so when they leave the colony, they spend a lot of time outside, or maybe they don't come back at all. Maybe they've drifted into another colony and thereby spread the varroa and viruses that they were carrying with them. And this other really cool paper by Jeffrey et al. Um, found that bees that were infected with Israeli acute paralysis virus were actually more likely to admit non-natal bees to their colonies. And so you can see this is the proportion of bees accepted by guards at the colony entrance. And you can see that these bees that had IAPV were much more likely to admit um, non-natal bees to their colony. So again, this viral infection increasing dispersal of mites and other viruses because these colonies are less able to guard themselves against robbers or drifters. They're more likely to admit bees that do not belong in that colony. And this is where we get more spreading of these things around the landscape. So um, colonies are both sending bees out that are sick and more likely to accept sick bees uh, when they are sick. So this all just sort of contributes to um, bees mixing a lot between colonies and apiaries and your neighbor's bees sort of gaining admission to your colonies uh, relatively easily. And we also know from this paper from DeGrandy Hoffman that mite populations are affected by the number of foragers carrying mites. And so this was another really cool study where they actually captured the foragers as they were leaving and coming from the colonies and checked um, how many of them had mites on them. And you can see that as soon as the proportion of foragers with mites starts to spike, um, that's also when the mite populations in the colony start to spike. And this says actual versus predicted. So the red line is what was the predicted mite population growth based on bro reproduction models. And you can see that the actual mite load is much higher than that uh, once the foragers start to return with mites. So this sort of indicates that we have this outside source of mites um, that is increasing the mite load of these colonies sort of a lot more and a lot faster than we would expect from mite reproduction alone. So this external source of mites sort of coming in from other colonies contributing to higher mite loads in these apiaries. Um, and so you know, a lot of this is sort of explained by um, this idea of drifting and or robbing. And so these are two different activities um, that colonies can engage in. And this paper by Peck and Seeley kind of um, picked apart the differences between um, sort of this mite bomb idea and this robbing idea. And so the mite bomb idea is that you have a high mite colony with bees that are heavily infected with mites and you know maybe they're um, spending more time outside the colony or their navigation abilities are impaired and they're not as capable of finding their way home. The bees from this high mite colony are going to go out into the landscape and they're gonna visit other nearby colonies um, through drift or maybe by robbing. And in that process, they will carry and spread varroa mites with them. And then the other sort of side of the coin is this robbing idea. And this, you know, Peck and Seeley found that there's sort of more support for this robbing idea and other papers have supported this better as well. That basically you have these healthy colonies in the landscape. Say you're a beekeeper and these are your, these receiver colonies are your healthy 
colonies that you've been taking really great care of all season. You've been keeping your mite loads low, feeding a lot. So you have these really strong, beefy, healthy colonies come fall. Um, your bees are gonna be uh, experiencing a dearth most likely in the late fall in most locations. And so your foragers aren't gonna have a lot to do. They're gonna be going out into the landscape and looking for resources. And they're gonna start picking on other colonies in this phenomenon we call robbing. And they are more likely gonna target weak colonies that are easy targets for robbing, right? So they're gonna come across these colonies with high mite loads that maybe haven't been taken that great a care of all season. Um, and these high mite colonies are an easy target for robbing. So your great healthy bees are gonna rob out this high mite colony and through that process, they will pick up mites while they're in here doing that robbing. And then when they return home, you know, to your colonies, they're going to bring those mites they picked up with them. And so, um, you know, this seems to be kind of a better explanation for the mechanism of how this happens is that these receiver colonies pick up mites from these high mite colonies through the process of robbing. Um, but either way, right, this is a huge problem. What if you have any neighbor in your proximity that has sort of a weak high mite colony that's going to get picked on by healthy hives, then your beautiful healthy hives you spent all summer caring for are going to have skyrocketing mite loads really quickly as those foragers return with mites. And you're going to have to treat um, again and sort of more frequently than you might have expected to. And so it's really important to make sure you check your mite loads repeatedly, even after you apply a treatment, because we want to make sure that if this phenomenon is happening, you catch it before your colonies have to overwinter. And so um, as part of my PhD project at the University of Maryland with my advisor, Dennis Van Engelsdorp, we wanted to kind of look at this phenomenon and test whether we could um, sort of interrupt some of this process of just the mixing between colonies, you know, if we um, can make some of these colonies a little bit more defendable and sort of reduce the mixing of bees through drifting or robbing, if we can slow this increase in mite load. And so we set this up at one of our research farms at the University of Maryland. And basically the experimental setup was that we had this donor apiary in the center and so the donor apiary had two high mite colonies that had like greater than six mites per hundred bees and two low mite colonies that had less than one mite per hundred bees. And we set up eight receiver colony, uh, eight receiver apiaries all around that had four colonies each. And we wanted to track where these donor bees went and the associated changes in mite loads in these colonies. And then to test sort of a possible intervention um, of this whole robbing and drifting process, um, we put screens on some of these colonies as well. And I'll show you what that looks like in just a second. But to track the movement of the donor bees, cameras were placed um, on every colony and receiver apiaries. And the cameras were trained to recognize um, the painted bees from the donor apiary. So through this process, we could actually capture where the bees from the donor apiary were ending up in receiver colonies and you know, through mite samples track the associated changes in mite load. And then two of those colonies were screened as well. So when we have a receiver apiary all set up, this is what it looks like. Um, these are the little cameras above the colony entrances. We have the robbing screens on two of the colonies. And so the idea here is that the colonies that are screened are gonna be more capable of fending off robbing or drifting bees. They're gonna be less likely to have um, bees that don't belong in these colonies end up in there. And so we predicted that colonies with robbing screens might experience lower increases in mite loads compared to these colonies that were, you know, just more loose and open and not as defended um, with the robbing screens. And so what we saw is that um, mite, mite load increases were definitely higher in colonies that were visited by donor bees. So here we have the percent change in mite load in colonies that were never visited by any bee from the donor apiary and in colonies that were visited by bees from the donor apiary. And you can see that bees that were visited um, by bees from that donor apiary, whether from a high or low mite colony, 
had much higher increases in mite loads. And so this kind of suggests that colonies that are receiving visitors from any type of colony, you know, whether it's coming from a colony with high mites or low mites, or whether it's robbing or drifting, any kind of mixing of bees where a colony is, um, you know, allowing or um, susceptible to receiving bees from another colony, they're just less protected. They're more likely to have an increase in mite load. And we see, again, when we look at the robbing screen data, that screen colonies did have smaller increases in mite loads. So again, we have that percent change in mite load in non-screen colonies, screen colonies, and we did have a significantly lower increase in mite load um, in the screen colonies. So again, seems like there is a benefit to sort of reducing and tamping down on this spread um, of bees mixing between apiaries and anything you can do to protect your colonies from having um, bees from other apiaries enter your colonies is probably a good thing. And so, you know, this also kind of points to this idea that the permissiveness of the receiver colony is likely an important factor. So, you know, we have bees moving around from um, high and low mite donor colonies, and then also from receiver colonies, just every colony in the landscape, there's lots of moving and drift going on um, of all these bees. And then the idea is that as these bees are moving through the landscape, looking for a colony to enter, maybe to engage in robbing, if they come across a really strong and healthy colony that's you know full of bees and you know low mite load, low viral load, um, or if it has a screen on it, right? Anything that makes this colony more capable of protecting itself, um, these non-natal visiting bees are going to have a harder time gaining entrance to that colony. And so they might be put off by that colony and they might just skip over it to another colony nearby that's weaker, you know, maybe they're smaller, maybe the guard bees aren't as defensive um, or there's no screen on there for whatever reason they come across a colony that's easier to gain entrance to. Um, they're gonna skip over that strong one that's hard to gain entrance to and go to this colony that's easier for them to get into, right? So, um, you know, again, kind of anything you can do to make sure that your hives are strong and healthy um, and cut down on this mixing of bees between colonies seems to be beneficial. Uh, and so, you know, basically to sum up, we know that our landscapes are very crowded with colonies. Um, if you're part of your local beekeeping club, you know, you probably know who your neighbors are, you know where their colonies are, you know how close they are to yours. Um, and so we really, need to be thinking about this at a community level. You know, we know that colonies pass mites to each other through drift and robbing, and that there's a lot of mixing in the landscape. And so varroa management should really be something that we're thinking about at a community level and at a landscape level. Um, and that we really make sure we're taking the best care of our bees we can, and that all of our neighbors are also taking care of their bees the best they can to make sure that sort of everybody in the community has the strongest, healthiest hives possible to make sure that we cut down on this mixing and drifting and robbing between apiaries. And so that's all I have for you today. Um, the work I presented was funded by the Eastern Apicultural Society and Northeast SARE. My lab at University of Maryland helped a ton. Um, that's all I have. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed.